born in New York, but your family originally comes from Croatia. So I'm wondering Croatia, yeah. Croatia, Croatia. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering what kind of music scene. What was the mainstream music that you know uh, Croatia is supporting or was supporting at the time when you were born and growing up there? Well, you know, I have an interesting story because I was I was born in New York City, uh, like you found out. But I I did my primary school in the United States, mm-hmm. so I lived with my family until I was about thirteen in the United States. So I basically grew up my childhood in the U.S. speaking English. Uh, like you know any other American kid, mm. my mother is first generation American, mm. uh, although she is born to Croatian parents. Mm-hmm. And my father came to this country when he was thirteen uh, years old, so he was Croatian born uh, to Croatian parents, and they they came here. They basically were uh, escaping communism. Okay. Yep. And they they came to this country and and built a life for themselves. But both of my parents are American citizens. They were educated in the United States. So when I was born, um, you know, I I basically uh, did everything in English. I was you know an American girl with a Croatian background, basically. Mm-hmm. And then around the time I was thirteen. Um, Or around the time I was twelve, my parents thought it would be uh, an exciting adventure for our family to go uh, to live in Croatia for a couple of years. You know, just get acquainted with our roots and and uh, learn a little bit about who we are and and uh, just see this other side of our family history. And then we moved. Which, of course, at the age of thirteen, was a very difficult uh, thing to do to be uprooted from your from your life when you're just beginning to be a teenager. Mm. And uh, and I also because I had spent my entire life living in the states, I didn't speak Croatian fluently. I, oh, right. I barely I barely spoke Croatian at all. You know, I knew some words, and Croatian was always kind of a part of our our surrounding, but it was not something that we spoke fluently at home. And uh, and uh, and probably this was because my mother was American born, even though she spoke Croatian. English is her first language. Mm. And my father came to the states when he was so young that he was fluent in both English and Croatian, and so it just ended up being English was spoken. Mm. So uh, so when we moved to Croatia. I had an interesting thing happen. You know, I I had been playing classical violin from the time I was four years old. Mm. Um, and I was very serious about the violin. I, in, when I was younger, I mean, when I was in uh, in primary school, I really wanted to be a concert violinist. That was kind of what I what I had envisioned for myself as a potential career choice. And uh, and then I went to Croatia. And the interesting thing about uh, school, academic school in Croatia, is that you don't have the same thing in Croatia as you do in the States, which is called extracurricular activities. Mm-hmm. So this is, you know, you go to your, your junior high school or your high school, you have your academic classes, and then after school you have all of the other classes like theater and art and music and and uh, sports and all of these things, but they're all organized by the, the school. Mm-hmm. And in Croatia, it's not like that. You basically go to high school or junior high school simply for your academics. And then you, if you wish to have some or other form of engagement, you actually have to enroll yourself in another school. So for my, in my case, it would be music school. So the problem was that I didn't speak Croatian, so I couldn't enroll myself in music school. And so when we moved there, I found a, a violin teacher who spoke English, and she would come once a week to to our apartment and give me a lesson. But you know, when you're when you're that age and you are practicing and taking lessons, but you have no um, recital or concert opportunities, you kind of start to lose interest. You know, the, mm. you you basically, as a kid, you're working all the time. Well, as a kid and also as, a, as an adult, you're working all the time to be able to show what you've learned, what you've practiced, what you've developed over time. Mm. And, uh, and so, so this kind of coincided with me feeling very lost in Croatia because I also couldn't speak English. And this was my way of expressing myself through the English language. And so I started to sing more. I had always been singing since I was uh, since I was very, very little. But uh, it seemed like a way that I could connect 
with my language by singing in English. Mm. And I found um, I found a voice teacher uh, when I was at the beginning of high school in the Rock Academy of Zagreb. And she spoke a little bit of English, and she was a classically trained uh, vocalist, and she gave me singing lessons. And there were recitals at the end of each semester. So I had the opportunity to sing in front of people and, and have these little concerts. And so, and just naturally, I'm not really sure how, but I gravitated towards jazz and blues and Motown. Um, you know, I was never really a fan of pop music. Mm. Um, even though I have nothing against pop music, I just, it was not something that made me feel something in my soul. You yeah. know, when I, when I heard jazz and blues, um, and soul, this, you know, those kinds of things really made me light up inside. So, so that's basically how that started. Well, yeah, so that's, so that's where, that's where I started to take my, my singing lessons. And, uh, and that's where I kind of, uh, got a little bit of my basic training in vocal technique and, and started learning about taking care of the voice as an instrument hmm. because, you know, singing, singing is an interesting thing because everybody has a voice. You're born with one, hmm. whether it's a, whether it's you're, you're, you're blessed with the talent of having a musical ability or not. Everybody has a voice to speak usually. Hmm. Uh, and so in order to speak, you can also sing. And um, so that's what I think makes it seem so informal to most people. Um, informal meaning that anybody can do it. Gotcha. Something that is not that concrete and you cannot pin down one, two, three exactly. things. Because but. not everybody can say, I'm going to pick up the saxophone and I'm just going to play a little bit. Mm -hmm. Everybody is born with a voice and they carry this instrument around with them in their body all the time. And so if they choose to sing in the car or sing in the shower or sing at school or sing on the street, they can sing wherever they want. And so this idea of taking singing lessons, it's kind of like this fun thing that is not too serious. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's interesting how people don't take it as seriously or they don't look at it as having the same kind of dedication hmm. as when you commit to buying or renting an actual instrument and taking the lessons for that. Mm -hmm. How do you take care of your voice? You know, if, if you, if you yeah. had a student and you say, listen, you're a complete beginner, uh, these are a few basic elements of how to keep uh, your voice healthy. Yeah. I mean, before I even get into vocal technique and health, I get into just health in general. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big proponent of being aware of your body mm -hmm. and how your body affects you because our instrument, the voice is the only one that we can't physically see. So everything is dependent on how we feel and how aware we are of the changes in our body. Mm. So, For example, um, you know, and this is also why emotions and the psychology is so important in singing as well, because the way you feel directly impacts the effectiveness of your instrument. Hmm. So if you're sad or if you're angry or if you're happy um, or if you're tired or, um, you know, all of these things, they impact how you sing. Hmm. And so one thing that I teach my singers above all is that you have to be aware of, in general, where you are each day in mm. terms of where you are in your body, how you feel, how much exhaustion or energy you have. And then you have to accept where your voice is every day mm. because your voice will not necessarily be able to do the same thing every single day. Mm. And this is something that we have to make peace with very early on or else it gets to us psychologically. And then that psychological effect affects our, uh, our performance. Mm. So, you know, I, I've done a lot of body work with yoga and, and, uh, and breathing and just kind of things that allow me to be aware of different parts of my body. 
So I really feel like psychologically, when you become aware of something, even if you don't know too much about it, just this beginning awareness mm. gives you so much knowledge and it's so effective in how to take care of yourself. Because if I, you know, if I've spent my entire life, let's say, with my shoulders tensed up all the way around my ears, mm. and then one day I become aware of that tension, every so often throughout the day, I'm going to be telling myself to relax my shoulders. And then in doing so, this is directly going to affect my voice. That, 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 so, yeah. That, that, that's a brilliant answer to that. That's for sure. And so for all of my, my students, usually, you know, we do uh, what, you know, when I give a lesson or a master class, for example, we do vocal technique, but a lot of it is body work. Also, we stretch, hmm. we, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't go running without stretching. You can't do a, you know, cardio exercise without stretching your muscles. And the same thing is for, for your voice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're, I mean, I actually had a very interesting thing happen just last week. Um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm a big exerciser. I, I, I love doing exercise and I love to stay in shape and, and keep my body healthy. Mm. Um, but I go through these phases where sometimes I like more of the yoga and Pilates, you know, these fluid movements that are more about breathing and mindfulness. And then sometimes I love these very intense cardio exercises that are very much about getting your heart rate up. Mm. And, uh, so we had just gotten back from a very long tour and I started to do my intense cardio exercises <laughs> and, and I hadn't done them in a, in a few weeks this intensely. And what happened was that I actually tensed up my neck by doing a lot of these exercises because my muscles were so, um, they weren't used to doing them for mm. a few weeks. And then that affected my voice. And I had a lot of tension right under my chin in these, in the muscles that go between your chin and your, and the top of your, uh, thyroid. Mm. And it, and I thought it was very interesting that even me, I'm so aware of my voice and I'm so aware of my body that when I started doing these exercises again, after three weeks or however long, uh, I hadn't done them that, uh, that even I got tricked, you know, mm. <laughs> But good awareness of it because I read also you've got a dual degree degree from psychology, I do. yes, as well as yeah, I, you know, I I uh, I started out uh, my my studies as a psychology major and uh, music was just kind of a, a hobby, even though I loved music, there was nobody in my family who was a full time artist, mm. and even though my family has always supported me and they are big supporters of the arts um, because I didn't have anyone to show me that being an artist professionally is possible. Mm. I just didn't think of it as being an option. And then once I started college, I realized that this huge thing was missing from my life and I was very unhappy. And, uh, and the, And I, I guess I was aware enough to realize that the time that I was the happiest in that beginning of college was when I had my, uh, my jazz improvisation course every week. Mm. And I was taking just, you know, a few jazz classes in uh, conjunction with my psychology classes. And it really struck me as being interesting that that's where I was the happiest in my life, in that year of my life. And I thought, you know, maybe this is a sign and maybe I have to make a change. But I was, of course, terrified of letting go of psychology, which seemed like um, the road to a so-called real job. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and so I decided to continue with psychology also because it really interested me. And, um, and I actually ended up doing my senior thesis on how we process music and just the psychology behind music why we like certain kinds of music, why we have memories of certain things because of the music that was playing. I mean, I, I managed to combine the two loves of my life in, in that way. But then, of course, music took over and I, and I became a full-time performer. And uh, psychology is something that I think has really uh, contributed to my knowledge of people and my knowledge of myself. 
uh, and it's absolutely something that I could continue later on if I if I chose to. Mm. So I'm I'm very glad that I did it. You went to music school, did you? I did. I did and uh, the music school for jazz and contemporary music, where I got my degree in jazz. And do, do you remember? Uh, but, do you remember what were your favorite classes from there? Mm, and what was the auditioning I, process? Yeah. Well, actually, I had a very difficult auditioning process, um, and that goes back to the vocal health. Uh -huh. So, you know, I was um, enrolled in a college called Northeastern University in Boston, mm -hmm. where I was a psychology major, and uh, and this was where I had my one uh, jazz vocal, uh, or I'm sorry, jazz improvisation course uh, once a week, and uh, and I decided that I wanted a change in my life. But I wanted to continue the psychology, and I found the new school, which basically has a liberal arts college that you can continue your psychology degree, mm. and then they have the jazz conservatory where you can do your jazz degree. And so I enrolled in this basically two colleges at the same time under the same university, uh, and I I applied to both colleges. I got into both colleges, uh, and then I had to go to my new school audition. Mm. So I came down from Boston, uh, and I remember my audition was like uh, 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. So I think I came down to New York on a Friday afternoon from Boston. I stayed with a friend of my mother's, and that weekend I developed bronchitis. Mm. And I remember calling on the Friday afternoon uh, to the office. And I remember saying that I had developed bronchitis and I, they could hear clearly that they couldn't speak hmm. very well and that I was nervous about my audition. And basically I got a very, you know, <laughs> kind of nasty response saying, well, there are many people who want to audition for this school. And, uh, if you don't want your audition, then, uh, you know, good luck. Gotcha. You can, you can, you can try again next year. Mm. And so I ended up going to the audition and I sang without my voice. And of course, at that point, I didn't have the kind of technique that I have now. So I blew out my vocal cords. I hurt myself mm. and I didn't get into the school. Mm. I got put on the waiting list. And so I came in the following semester um, but basically what ha what I, it was a really good lesson for me because you can never sacrifice your instrument in order to make something work in the moment because the damage that you can potentially do to your instrument mm. can affect the rest of your life. You know, with, you know, when you're younger, of course, everything seems like it has to happen now. So if I, You know, if I didn't get in now, I couldn't wait till the next semester. But that ended up, it ended up happening anyway because I didn't get in for the first thing because my audition was not very great because of my uh, my sickness, mm. and I had to wait anyway. But in the process, I hurt my voice, and that summer I actually decided to enroll in the the new school has a jazz workshop every summer in Italy, mm -hmm. Bassano del Grappa. And I met an incredible jazz vocal technique uh, teacher named Kate Baker. And she changed my life. She changed my technique. Uh, I came to her with, you know, basically a very damaged voice from having sung so violently on my bronchitis mm. and, my, and my swollen vocal cords. And she taught me. She nursed me back and made my voice better and stronger, and I've been studying with her ever, ever since. Mm -hmm. And she was the one that really helped me become acquainted with my body and my voice and see how the two are really not separated at all. They're one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this was a really important lesson for me. Do you have any techniques, you know, when you're on the road, obviously you're flying on the plane, mm -hmm. you're, you know, mm -hmm. changing the temperature, and let's say you get cold, and, you know, the show needs to happen, you know, one way or another. Uh, yeah. Do you have any techniques on your own how to, you know, you got a cold, Absolutely. But you're going to do something anyway, so that would be great if you could share it. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, one thing that is just, uh, <laughs> I'm always, uh, I always have my scarf 
-hmm. I always have many layers. So uh, that's my, my, my touring trick is layers. Mm. So if I need to be in my t-shirt because it's too hot, that's fine. But I have two or three more things that I can cover myself with plus the big scarf to go around my neck. Mm. No matter what time of year it is, no matter what uh, place I'm in, I have the layers available. Mm. Um, and then I always have my thermos with, with uh, usually throat coat tea or at least something warm that I can drink if I'm too cold. Let's say on the airplanes, it's mm. common to, to get really cold on airplanes and it just helps to have something warm in you all the time. Mm. Um, I have my vocal exercises that are more in more than vocal strengthening exercises. They're vocal therapy exercises. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of exercises with straws, uh, blowing straws in water. Mm -hmm. And uh, water is very therapeutic because um, uh, it basically, whenever you do an exercise with water, whether it's through a straw or you're gargling mm -hmm. with the water, um, you know, the vocal cords, they basically come together, but they don't hit completely. So if your vocal cords are... Um, are swollen, for example, and you do um, a warm up where your vocal cords are coming together hundreds of times in order to vibrate. Mm. Uh, you're basically irritating your vocal cords before you have to sing, and you're causing uh, you're causing them to to get swollen. Mm. So when you do these exercises with water. They, it allows the vocal cords to come together enough to vibrate and create sound, but the water allows for the hydration, mm. and it also allows you to uh, to not uh, make the cords swell anymore mm. than they have to. And then another thing that was introduced to my life, uh, actually by my next door neighbor, who is a voice therapist, uh, she told me. Um, last year I had a, a situation where I was actually on tour and I got an upper respiratory, uh, infection, mm. which caused la laryngitis and I lost my voice in the middle of the tour. Mm. So this is not that I was sick and in, in bed with the temperature and I, you know, couldn't, couldn't, my throat was hurting and all these things. It was really, I felt completely fine. Only I had no voice. Mm. And uh, so basically what happens with laryngitis is that your, your vocal cords swell so much that they can no longer vibrate, vibrate. and create sound. And so um, I was introduced to this incredible contraption called a nebulizer. Hmm. And there is new research uh, with vocal uh, therapy that suggests that when you put a simple saline solution, so basically uh, salt water hmm. uh, inside this nebulizer, and you inhale this cool mist, mm. uh, the, the saline, uh, the salt helps the water adhere to the vocal cords, and then it hydrates your vocal cords for up to four hours. Mm. So it helps a lot with inflammation, mm. which when you're on tour, your vocal cords get very inflamed. Mm. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Number one, you're singing almost every day. Number two, you're tired because you're traveling and you're singing almost every day. Um, number three, I mean, vocalists are more prone to, I mean, vocal, any kind of wind instrument or singer, we're more prone to have uh, acid reflux mm -hmm. more than any other instrumentalist, just because there is so much more air coming out of, uh, you know, being pushed out than, than normal when you're just speaking. Mm. Um, and then of course, being on the road, you know, for me, um, I don't eat before I sing. Mm. I, I wait, I try to wait at least 45 minutes. And if I can't wait that long, I'll always have something light. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're on the road, you have to eat when there's food. And sometimes for me, you know, the band gets to eat 15 minutes before we go on stage, <laughs> but I can't. So I have to, you know, I have to save the food, but that means that I also have to eat after the concert, which mm. means it's now very late. Mm. So, you know, you, you eat late at night and then you go to sleep immediately and the food hasn't been digested and then you have to wake up uh, a few hours later. So, you know, these are all things that help 
that are that are not helpful with the acidity and the acid reflux and these kinds of things, which also cause inflammation of the vocal cords. Hmm. Are there any books that are like a textbook that every teacher should have as a standard teaching instructional material in their collection at home? You know, I haven't actually found any physical textbooks mm -hmm. that go in depth about this vocal health and vocal training. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of technique books out there, um, but everything about vocal technique and vocal health, I've learned from my teacher, Kate Baker, mm -hmm. um, and then from you know my next door neighbor who is actually a doctor in voice therapy. Mm. So I've basically just taken the advice and techniques of people that I have seen the success mm -hmm. from And then I've used it and applied it to myself, and then I've applied it to how I teach others. Mm. But I, I haven't yet found a textbook that has all of that in it. Mm. And I've actually been thinking about writing one myself. Yeah, that means that there's certainly a space for it, you know, on a market. It sounds very exciting yeah. and very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, technique books exist all over the place, but, you know, the interesting thing about my teacher, Kate, is she's taken not only vocal technique exercises that are for singers, but she's taken vocal therapy exercises that are given to people with voice problems. For example, if you stutter or mm -hmm. if you don't know how to pronounce words or, you know, she's taken very interesting things from information that she's learned all over the world about different voices and different kinds of physical uh, problems that you can have with the voice. And, uh, and so that, that's helped me a lot. Um, but in terms of using the voice musically, because, you know, technique is one side and you can have fantastic technique and have a very strong voice, but then musically you need to know how to use it too. Hmm. And especially in jazz, you know, with, um, you know, I use the voice a lot as, a, as an instrument. So singing a lot of wordless melodies, uh, improvising, uh, you know, using the voice in, in ways other than just with lyrics. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the books that I've used have been instrumental books, books written for instrumentalists uh, that I've then adopted for the voice and created my own exercises from, you know, within, within the book. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, I've used a lot of Antonio's drum books. Uh, yeah, I uh, remember you mentioning syncopation and the snare yeah, studies. Yeah, syncopation. <laughs> yeah, syncopation. Syncopation. Um, that's an incredible book that I learned, that I use with a lot of my students. I mean, you know, the thing about, singing is that it's not really taught in the same way that instrumentalists are taught, but I really feel that in a way they should be mm -hmm. because we are, we still have an instrument, even if you can't see it. And we have to learn how to do interesting things with harmony and rhythm, just like any other instrumentalist. Mm. So, um, you know, for example, many, uh, most of the vocal exercises, technique exercises that exist are always major, mm. always. And so I, you know, I, I've been thinking in terms of this technique and also just um, using the voice as an instrument, starting to introduce just basic music theory and ear training, but in conjunction with the vocal training and mm. technique. Mm. Because part of the reason that we can hear major so well is because we're practicing it all the time. So if we were to practice technique in a minor major, you know, in a, in a half whole scale, <laughs> you know, these kinds of things would, would be ingrained in the ear. So, so yeah, the syncopation book has been great. Um, also how to improvise by Hal Crook. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Really He's great. a trombonist. Yeah, he's a trombonist. Yeah. Uh, and then David Berkman also has a great book, actually uh, geared towards singers, mm -hmm. that he wrote, uh, which is which is fantastic. And I've I've learned a lot from that and and taught from that as well. Now, when you're talking, and then another, yeah, yeah and then one one other book that I've uh, that I've worked with. Uh, just by myself, I haven't actually started teaching from it, but because it's it's difficult enough for me, I'm just trying to understand it. Is the um, uh, oh, advanced rhythmic concepts for the modern drummer? All right, yeah. By Steve Langone. Steve Langone.
but um, you know, so so for for vocal vocal health, I you know I'm always just trying to teach teach my students about being aware of their body and. And uh, of course, learning how to breathe and learning about the anatomy of the body is so in- important mm. too. I mean, I I, I have a, a go-to video uh, that shows how the diaphragm exactly works mm. because you know a lot of us know we have the diaphragm and there's always somebody saying use your diaphragm, but we have no idea what this means. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I have um, these little videos that show exactly the anatomy of the, the, the human body and how it relates to the voice. Mm. Also understanding the different layers of the anatomy. So understanding how the muscles in the neck work, understanding how uh, you know, the muscles in the neck and the shoulders, uh, the anatomy of the throat and, and where it sits, where the vocal cords are, what the vocal cords look like. I mean, all of these things because of the fact that we can't see our instrument, it's so important to know what it is hmm. and how it functions. What were your biggest challenges when you were a student for you, either artistically or academically? What were the biggest challenges when you were a student? Huh. What, I mean, when I was a student, I think um, the biggest challenge was consistently putting myself in uncomfortable musical situations. And I think that that's probably a challenge for any young musician. Mm-hmm. But for example, in when I was in college, I was one of the first vocalists who dared audition for uh, an instrumental ensemble, for example, mm-hmm. because I wanted to sing that kind of music, but nobody was accepting Or no, but it wasn't that people were not accepting, but they were just so not used to a vocalist wanting to be part of that, Mm -hmm. that it seemed strange. So, um, so I was, I would go and audition for these instrumental ensembles and I, I was, you know, I was very raw and I was not very good at improvising and, and, uh, I was learning how to, um, learning how to express myself musically while still keeping my technique and, and, um, you know, just figuring out these two identities of my voice being a lyrical instrument and an experimental instrument as Mm. well. So I think that was probably the, the most difficult, you know, ear training, um, that, that kind of always came easily to me. I, I always had a good ear and probably because of the fact that I played violin for so many years, mm-hmm. very seriously, I had a, a basic understanding of at least classical musical music theory. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and because I had, uh, done so much work on the violin, I think I had a, a basic, you know, just, just a basic understanding and an ear for, for the sound. Mm. So, you know, I, I don't have perfect pitch, for example, but I have quite good relative pitch. Hmm. And I think that the, the violin helped with that. What are the common mistakes or false assumptions that the students make? I mean, I think, you know, any any student, whether it's a singer or an instrumentalist, I think the biggest the biggest leap is, you know, you, you basically grow up listening to all of the, all of your, um, influences, Mm -hmm. all of the people that, uh, that inspire you, all of the music that you love and you kind of develop your sound based on how your influences sound. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest, um, challenge for, for all young musicians is how to find your own personality and how you're playing and how you're singing, how to find your voice. Mm -hmm instead of sounding like somebody else's voice Hmm. and then how to do it well, you know, finding something that's unique to you, something, something that, um, something that only you do that sets you apart from other people. And I think that, um, uh, that usually comes with a lot of years of experience and, and work and development. Uh, but it's always something that is on the back of your mind and kind of stresses you out also. <laughs> Where these influences came to you? Where did they come from? I mean, you know, I, I really, I, I think that a lot of that 
uh, came from listening to so many different instrumentalists and different instruments and trying to match my intonation with those instruments. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, and that was because I was so focused on the voice being part of, let's say the horn section, as opposed to me just being the lyrical singer who sings. And then I stop and everybody else takes a solo. And then I sing the lyrics again. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the idea was that I wanted to be part of a section. I really wanted to be part of the group. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess, you know, I also learned that from singing in, in, uh, when I was very young, I sang in, in, in choirs. Mm -hmm. in jazz, co in chorus and in school and things like that. And, you know, when you're a group, you have to make certain decisions uh, to sing together and make it sound like a uniform, a unified, uh, a unified group. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of took those principles and adopted it to, let's say, doubling with a saxophone or a guitar mm -hmm. or a vibraphone or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it's really just about listening because I, I have a lot of jazz students that, that come up to me. And for example, they say, they ask me, Tana, what's, um, what are the syllables, the scat syllables that you use? Mm. And, you know, there are obviously suggestions that you can give for, um, you know, if you want something to be more staccato, there are certain syllables that make things sound more staccato. And if you want something more legato, then, then you have other ones. Hmm. But every, every voice is different, first of all. Every physical face and mouth and muscles are different. And, and, and then proficiency is also different. So, so the way that Ella Fitzgerald scats is very different from the way that Sarah Vaughn scats. And it's just the same way that, uh, you know, the way that, uh, um, you know, that any instrumentalists take us, takes a solo on their instrument is very different from somebody on the same instrument. Hmm. You know, you can, you can tell the difference between, uh, Coltrane and any other saxophonist, Absolutely. you know, they just develop a sound. Hmm. And, um, but that I think comes from listening to a lot of music hmm. and, and, uh, you know, taking those, um, those influences and putting them in your vocabulary, your jazz vocabulary. Hmm. You could start with Oath to Heroes if you like. Sure. So Ode to Heroes was a little different. I mean, it was my first album. Um, and the way that actually a lot of those compositions came about is that I was, uh, I was writing them a lot of those, uh, tunes and arrangements while I was still in school. Mm -hmm. So I was very influenced by the music that I was listening to the concepts that I was learning. <clears throat> and, uh, and for me with, with, with composing, every song is different the way that it comes about. I mean, sometimes I'll get a, a baseline in my head and then I'll try to work around that. Sometimes I'll come up with some lyrics and I'll try to uh, figure out some chords and a melody that goes along with those lyrics. It's, um, um, and, um, and so, you know, every, every song is a little bit different. Um, what ends up usually happening is that I, create a certain body of work mm -hmm. and then it kind of dictates to me what I'm actually writing about. Mm -hmm. So what I realized with Ode to Heroes and the reason that the album is named Ode to Heroes is that a lot of the, the music that I had written for that project, um, was based on the influences, my heroes, my musical heroes, mm. my life heroes, my, the people that were both in my personal life and, uh, and also musicians with their music who had influenced the way that I had learned about this incredible genre of music. Mm. So, um, and then back then, you know, because this was already, uh, I think I recorded Ode to Heroes back in 2012, even though it only came out in 2015. 15, yeah. So, <clears throat> so the music was, um, so the music was written in, you know, the year or two before, before that. And, um, and I, uh, have always created, um, garage band sequences. All right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, before logic, you know, I, I had garage band, 
and uh, and I would basically write music into GarageBand with the MIDI keyboard mm-hmm. and create all of the parts. Mm-hmm. And then I would listen to basically a, a, a sequence of the song that I wanted just to give me an idea of how it would sound. Hmm. And I would edit everything within GarageBand. And then from there, I would transcribe it into Sibelius and send it to the band. Mm-hmm. But instead of just sending them a PDF of the music, I would also send them the, the, the sequence just to give them a little bit of context. That's a very good prep work. Fair play. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of work, but it pays. I off. mean, it's it's a lot of work, but it, but you also you know you get you can get very detailed with your sequences, and so it really gives a good idea of what the song can be. Hmm. You know, so it really it really at least for me it helps me prepare uh, what the song is going to be. <clears throat> and did you get first with this band, you know, to get everybody together? Yeah. So with this, yeah. So this this band uh, on the on the first record, you know, I was playing. I actually had a uh, a monthly uh, residency at the uh, at the legendary Fifty Five Bar in New York, Fantastic, which is a yeah. great great little club. And uh, and there is where I really got to develop the live show. Mm. I really got to to it helped me figure out um you know just editing wise mm. what what worked and what didn't what was effective uh on the record but what was going to be effective live you know it was it was just a great learning experience for me and it also helped me play with a lot of different musicians mm-hmm. and see how different one song can actually be based on who's playing it <clears throat> That, that's great. So that was, yeah. yeah, that was a great experience. Uh, and then with, um, you know, so, and then also when I, when I recorded, uh, I basically went into the studio, I did two days of recording, uh, and then I did another day of overdubs. But back then I was not at all proficient in, uh, in pro tools or in post-production using anything post-production. I mean, it was basically, we recorded it, I listened to it and mixed it with my engineer, mm-hmm. uh, and and then that was basically the finished product. Mm. With Orna, which hasn't yet uh, been released, I took much more of a, of of a leading role in not only the composing and arranging, but also in the post production and in the recording process. Um, and I edited it everything myself in Pro Tools mm. and uh, and did a lot of the post-production. I mean, I did most of the post-production and Antonio actually co-produced it with me and helped me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a he has a great ear for, for a lot of these uh, uh, post-production elements, especially that because of the work that he did on Bad Ombre, mm. his record. And, uh, and so we worked together a lot on the post-production of this album. And then we sent it to uh, our engineer. And basically, we, we did a, a very good preliminary mix mm-hmm. in Pro Tools. And then we sent it to our engineer who put his artistic stamp on it. Mm. You know, when you're, let's say, mastering or when you're listening to the album, what kind of sound do you like from your band? So I could give you an example. Do you want your band to sound like a one big unity or do you want maybe the vocals to pop a little bit out or melody a little bit out or groove a little bit out? What is it that yeah, your think, taste is for basically yeah, the mixing? I think it, it depends on the song and Absolutely, how the yeah. voice is being used, you know? If the voice is being used as more of an instrument, mm-hmm. With, with without lyrics, I like for it to be a little bit more uh, blended with the rest of the band. Mm-hmm. And then when there are lyrics, of course, I want the lyrics to be understood, so I like for them to be elevated a little bit. Mm. Uh, but one thing that I've really come to love is just to have a band sound that's very present. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I hate listening to records where, you know, the bass and drums, you can barely find them or you can only hear the cymbals and you can't hear the kick or the toms or, you know, <laughs> and that's, of course, something that's, of course, something that I've that I've developed in my ear from also being with Antonio for so long mm-hmm. and now really understanding what I like from the drums and what I want out of the drums on any particular song mm-hmm. and uh, and just I, I, I just like to things to be warm for things to be big and uh, and balanced. You know, I, I never like it when the voice is too loud 
Um, I like everything to, you know, things that should pop out at certain times pop out and then they come out, they come back hmm. to the ensemble to create a blend. In the particular video in my master class, what is the pedal that you've got there? It it was great. It sounded yeah, great. So so that one uh that one is one of the ones that I use. It's an incredible looping device called the Boss R C five oh five. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is a very, very uh, complex and deep uh, looping and effects pedal. Hmm. It's an incredible instrument. It has five separate channels that you can record up to 90 hours of recordings on and loops. <laughs> and you can save things and you can put uh, track effects or, or recording effects. I mean, you can basically, you can do anything you want. Hmm. But... I also uh, incorporate the TC Helicon Voice Live Touch 2, mm -hmm. uh, and I use that only for effects. Mm -hmm. um, those have th that pedal has more of the the more beautiful delays and reverbs and uh, doubling effects and crazy, almost synth sounding uh, effects that you can put on the voice that make it almost sound otherworldly. Doesn't sound like a voice anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I really liked the combination of those two loopers. And my my working with pedals started actually after I've recorded my first album, Onto Heroes. Um, I did a lot of uh, background vocals in the studio. And when I was shopping in the album around to certain labels, they were telling me, you know, this is a really beautiful project. We really like the album, but it seems very complex. And how do you expect to recreate this in a live setting? Mm -hmm. And it was actually Antonio's idea to get my first little boss looper, which was a very, very beginner is looper. It, is it the red one? Is the red one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was called the, the Vocal Processor VE20, the Absolutely. Boss VE20. Good. And, uh, and I, I, lo I love that pedal. It had some great, great effects, and, and it was great to learn about the, just the idea of looping. But, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was a very basic looping pedal. You, you know, the minute you took out the loop, it would delete the loop. There was no memory. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just a very good beginning pedal for me. Mm. And, um, and so uh, I started to use that with my, with my group. And then slowly I graduated and got the Boss Looper, the big one, the RC505. Mm. And I used those two in conjunction with each other for a while. Mm. And then I dropped the red pedal and I got the TC Helicon. Mm. And uh, it's, it's, been, it's been incredible the amount of things that I can do now just by myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really, you know, doing an entire song by myself without any other instrument, being able to be the drums, be the bass, be the piano. Uh, you know, it's, it's really opened up so many uh, creative doors for me. Mm. And it's actually informed how I compose now. Mm. Well, it's, it sounds like an incredible arranging also experience. To understand Absolutely. the function of each instrument at each layer, yeah. uh, it, you, you made it sound wonderful. It, it was great. Uh, Thank you. I, I like that. I'm a big fan now. Uh, do you use any in-ear monitors when you are on the stage? No, I don't. For now, I just use basic uh, headphones, just mm -hmm. little earbuds mm -hmm. um, that um, that allow me to hear the click if it's a song where where I need to to hear the click. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I also have a, a cord that goes to the drummer who can also listen to the click. All right. Yeah. And what, what about the metronome then? Speaking of clicking and you're practicing, let's say, the easiest practice with the metronome. What metronome do you mm -hmm. use at home? What's the app or what's the software that you like using? Oh, I like this, um, this app. Let me see. What is it called? Um... Uh, there's both the metronome app is just called metronome cool, right? and the other one is called, and the other one is called temple. I use temple. both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Metronome is very good because you can also program certain subdivisions so that you can hear the subdivisions as you're hearing, uh, uh, the, the basic click. Yeah. So it's a really, it's a really good practice for, for polyrhythms mm. and, and things like that. If you want to get a little bit more, uh, in depth of that do you cope mm -hmm. well with situations like these you know competition and having your own expectations from your own abilities and try to push it harder do you have any approach I mean, to it? you know i 
I think I'm a little bit better at it now than, than I was when I started. Um, but you know, you always get discouraged and you always, you know, being a freelancer, especially Hmm. there are times when you're working all the time and you feel great and you feel useful and you feel successful. And then all of a sudden, after three months of working straight and not sleeping, you have a month of no gigs, (laughs) you know, I mean, it's, it's really, it's an up and down situation. And I think, you know, Antonio said once to me, being a jazz musician you have to be uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable all the time. <laughs> and I think that that's really true. I mean, you just have to kind of, you have to just do your best and, and, and try to see the positive thing, hmm. you know, and, 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 and I've also learned a lot from, from Antonio. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a very emotional person and I, I, get overwhelmed very easily. Mm. And, uh, and so for me, sometimes it's hard to compartmentalize what's happening in my life mm. and saying, this is related to this project. This is related to that project. So, you know, sometimes if one thing goes wrong in my head, I feel like everything is wrong, mm. but you know, Antonio has been a really good, uh, good person who's shown me how, you know, just because this one thing is not going the way you want it to go doesn't mean you can't change it, first of all. Mm. And second of all, it doesn't mean that everything else that you've worked for doesn't count. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, those are, I, I think I've gotten much better at uh, just dealing dealing with the stress of everything and uh, and being aware that if I am stressed out and if I don't feel particularly good, mm. the best medicine is to continue doing what I do and not stopping and feeling uh, like I'm frozen. Mm. Because the minute that you freeze, that's when you really kind of obstruct your creativity mm. and you you uh, you become this kind of uh, mean message in your own head. Hmm. that kind of that prevents you from doing what you do which is to create if if you were a teacher at the university and there are first year students that are just entering the course you're teaching in what piece of advice would you give to these students i would probably say that um you know being in this in this industry and being in music is uh, it's not an easy thing to do Um, And there are many times when you feel, no matter what level you're at, there are many times that you feel inadequate. There are many times that you feel um, less than your counterparts or your colleagues. Um, There are many times that you feel like you're not successful or you're not in the place where you should be. You know, it's a very self-critical industry to go into. Um, But that if you truly love it, you focus on the love of the music and you focus on being the best version that you can be of yourself Mm -hmm. in any given situation and just treat the entire experience with love because there will be so much frustration and anger and sadness and, uh, and, uh, you know, these kinds of things that go along with your incredible experience, Mm. but you need to find the love in it. And, uh, and just try your best because a lot of times what happens is you get frustrated, you, you feel discouraged. And so you stop trying because you, you, you're tired, Mm. but you should always keep trying and always keep doing your best and, and develop yourself, develop yourself as a human being and as a, as an artist, because the art is the best when it's truthful. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you just express yourself, who you are at the time that you are, there's no way that you can lose. Hmm. Donna, all the best in everything you do. Thank you so much, Peter. Nice to, nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you too.